issue, which I can't get around, is the fact that Physics Fest is happening Thursday, uh, April 23rd, or Tuesday, April 23rd. I can't remember, but anyway, and that's going to be hard to have class during that because it's going to be happening in the lobby, and it's a physics department. Yeah. So anyway, so in light of that, what I'm going to try and do is today hybridize two topics. So um, you could cancel the midterm. Uh, people have been asking me to do that. That's all I'll say. <laughs> all right, so, so I'm going to move through these first couple of pages rather uh, quickly, skipping some steps, because I really want to get to the, the meat of the topic that we would have covered Thursday. Um, so one of the things which I hope has become uh, evident to you is that a single space uh, can have many different uh, metrics. So for example, we can take R3, that's just normal three-dimensional Euclidean space, and if we work in, rec in, in rectangular coordinates, then the components of the metric are just uh, the identity, basically. It's the identity matrix. Whereas if we choose to describe the same space but use spherical polar coordinates, then the metric takes a different form. And you can get the form of the metric by taking the, the coordinate change from x, y, z to r, s, a, to phi, which I think many of you have seen before and as per what you did with your homework, figure out the transformation matrix and then appro appropriately transform the metric. Um, and you'll find that the metric takes the form one R squared, R squared, sine squared, theta, and zero everywhere else, okay? <coughs> so these are two very different looking metrics describing the same space, all right? And, um, you know, one of the sort of subtleties or one of the new ingredients that we have to be careful of is that in this case, of course, the components of G mu nu are the same as the components of G mu nu, okay, because this is its own inverse. But, of course, in the case of spherical polar coordinates, we find that this is no longer the case. Uh, the parentheses are just to say that the components of each uh, are not the same. They're not the same thing, period. One is defined to be one thing and one is defined to be another. Um, but I'm just saying whether the components are the same. Okay, so um, now uh, where it gets really weird, so the metric can look different depending on your coordinate system, but what's really weird is um, metrics can actually look very similar so, for example, I could give you the following metric in two dimensions. Which looks a lot like this metric, right? All I've done is peeled off the one and I've made little r big r. Okay? Um, however, the space described by this metric and the space described by this metric are very different. Does anybody know what space is described by this metric? What? Shape. Yeah, this is actually the surface of a two-sphere of radius capital R. Okay. Now that's fine if you couldn't identify that. It's, it's okay. I mean, you can basically take this thing and say, I fixed the value of R, so I'm now ignoring this coordinate. So I'm only doing a two-dimensional space, so I ignore that, and then I fix the value of little r to capital R. But here's the interesting thing. Despite the fact that this metric and this metric look very similar, this space is curved and this space is flat. And in general relativity, the difference between flat spaces and curved spaces is exactly the difference between whether you have gravity or not. Okay? So the, the lesson that I'm kind of throwing at you here is it is not going to be sufficient for us to write down a metric and kind of look at it and go, that describes curved space, or that describes flat space. We need something more sophisticated. We need something more sensitive, okay? And that's what we're gonna develop in time. But there's an even bigger problem, and that is the idea that our entire study of GR started with these equivalence principles, and one of the fundamental things in the equivalence principle is that in any space, for any manifold M, if I focus on a small enough neighborhood, in a small enough neighborhood, that manifold can be made to look approximately what, Colton? Sorry, I have to be left my down and home wrong time. <laughs> I'm going to need a phone time. I got a manifold in a small enough neighborhood, it can always look 
what? Flat, exactly. Okay, so there's a certain sense in which if I choose the right coordinates, the metric for any space in a small region can be made to look like the flat space metric. Okay, where if it's a spatial manifold, it would just be the identity. If it's a Lorentzian manifold with a time-like direction, it would be minus one, 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 one. Okay. Moreover, the idea that it's locally flat means that it's not just the metric that takes that form, but the first derivative of the metric vanishes. So it's flat over a small region. Okay. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to actually show you how this plays out. But what it, in the grand scheme of things, what it's saying is you really and truthfully cannot just look at the metric to figure out whether a space is curved. Because you can always, at least in a neighborhood, make the metric look flat. So if we want to know about whether a space is curved or not, we're going to have to develop something that is more sensitive to this, and I'll allude what that is after I go through a very, very quick example. So um, let's see how this actually looks in detail. And this is the notion of what are called local inertial coordinates. That is, there are coordinates in a, for which, in a small region, the metric takes this form and the first derivative of the metric vanishes. Okay. So let's start with a, cur with a space that's genuinely curved. All right. An example is S2, for which we've already written down the metric in the uh, uh, yeah yeah. So I'm going to use the coordinates data in phi to parameterize where I am on the S2. But the metric takes the form r squared r squared sine squared theta. Okay. And as we just discussed, this is a genuinely curved space. And so what does the S2 look like? Well, we of course naturally view it by an embedding into R3. So we have some uh, a fixed radius R, and then we basically have the surface of this sphere. So that's our S2. Okay. And then, um, this is a curved space, as I've argued to you, and we'll pr we can prove that later once we develop actual tools to describe curvature. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick a small region, and I'm going to make it formally look flat in that region. So uh, because we all love Christmas, yes, yes we're going to go to the North Pole. So the small region that I'm going to pick is going to be the region where theta, okay, the polar angle, is close to zero. Okay, remember, uh, if you don't remember the definitions of the angles in this picture, so theta is defined from the North Pole, and it goes from zero to 180. 180 is at the South Pole. And then the azimuthal angle is defined from, say, the positive x-axis, and the azimuthal angle goes from zero to two pi. So with those two angles, you can tell me any point on the sphere. Okay, the polar only goes from 0 to 180, and the azimuthal goes all the way around from 0 to 2 pi. Okay. Um, all right, so if we go up here, you know, theta equals 0, and we keep using these, uh, these angular coordinates, then, of course, in the vicinity, the metric takes this form, which is not a particularly nice metric. It's horribly degenerate. Um, <coughs> You can move around in the azimuthal direction, but since you're sort of in the theta equals zero region, moving in phi doesn't really do anything for you. That's why this is degenerate. So we would like to look for a better set of coordinates. So here is the better set of coordinates that we're going to use. Let's bring up here. So first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to formally relate the theta phi coordinates to the coordinates in the R3 in which the sphere is sitting, the x, y, and z. 
theta, cosine phi, sine phi, r cosine theta. Good. Okay. And so, um, in the limit of small theta, what we can do is we can approximate these by r cosine phi theta, theta r sine phi. Okay, using the small angle approximation that sine theta for small theta is approximately theta. Okay. And the idea here is, is that if we're sitting near the North Pole and we move around a little bit, we're not really moving in the z direction. Okay, for very small displacements away from the North Pole, you're largely moving in the x and y direction. Okay, and we kind of see that in these results. Okay, for small theta, you don't really move in z at all, and you just move in the x and y directions. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take these approximations and we're going to use them to convert from the theta phi coordinates to the xy coordinates. So the idea is simply that near the North Pole, if you're only moving very, in a region very close to the North Pole, you can describe your motion basically as motion in x and y. Go ahead. Should z over there equal r? <coughs> yes, yes. I, I am. Uh, yeah, no, sorry. Right. No, you're right. Sorry, you're totally right. But <coughs> the freedom to move is going to be encoded in x and y. You're right, I'm, I'm fixed at the value of r and z. Okay? So there's, um, and I'm just going to, there you saw it, it's going to be put on the website. But I actually go through the formal inversion of what this story looks like going from the theta phi description to the xy description, okay? And in the xy description, what we find is that the form of the metric is as follows. And when I write this, you'll kind of understand why I'm not going to go through the work in class that, that shows you this. The metric becomes 1 minus 2y squared over 3r squared. 2 times xy over 3r squared, 2xy over 3r squared, and 1 minus 2x squared over 3r squared. Okay. Definitely a non-intuitive result. But now we can start to see the benefit of actually adopting this xy description or these xy coordinates to describe things instead of trying to work with this theta phi set of coordinates. If I take this metric and I look at it in the vicinity of the North Pole, where those two things are approximately zero, so maybe I would only keep linear terms, what does the metric become? Yeah, it becomes the identity. All right. Clearly, this is quadratic in y. These are uh, products of x and y, and then that's quadratic in x. Okay. Moreover, if you take derivatives with respect to x or y, and then take the limit that x and y go to zero, you actually find that this thing vanishes. Okay? Because obviously if I take a derivative with respect to x or y, all of the quadratic terms are going to keep one of those variables, and then when you set the variable to zero, it vanishes. And when you take the derivative of the ones, those are just going to give you zero. Okay? So this particular coordinate description is doing exactly what I promised you local inertial coordinates would do. They make the metric trivial, that is flat, and they make the metric constant to at least first order. Okay? Now here's the important observation, and I'm going to pick a victim for this. Chance. Chance. In these coordinates, I have managed to make 
the north pole of the sphere look pretty much flat. That is, the metric takes this form, the derivative, first derivatives of the metric are zero. Looking carefully at this expression, if you can see it from the back of the room, if I wanted to really figure out that this space was truly curved, if I wanted to know that it really isn't just this, what thing would I have to consider? Um, the derivative along a path or something, or just the derivative of it? The, well, I mean, I just argued to you that the first derivative of the thing vanishes. I'm not sure. I can always make the first derivative vanish. Second derivative? Boom, yeah. You can't make the second derivative of this vanish. Okay. If you take second derivatives, you're just going to get a constant out of this, but then there's no limit sending x and y to zero that's going to make that constant go to zero. And it doesn't matter if you take the second derivative with respect to y, second derivative with respect to x, or mixed derivatives dx and then dy. Okay? So that's important because what it tells us is if we want something that is actually able to see through local inertial coordinates, see through them and their sort of charade of local flatness, we're going to have to look at something that is built out of second derivatives of the metric. Okay? And that's what we're going to do formally. <coughs> All right. So um, one last statement about this, and then I'm going to press on to the main topic for today. And that is um, <coughs> the idea of local inertial coordinates actually provides us with an incredibly powerful tool that is very similar to something we did in special relativity. So you might remember in special relativity there was a trick we could use where if we needed a complicated equation that was true in general, we could write down what the equation looked like, looked like in a very special circumstance, and as long as we wrote it in the right way, it was true in general. Does anybody remember what special circumstance we made use of in special relativity? So an explicit case of this was when we were writing down the energy momentum tensor for a perfect fluid. Oh, rest frame? Yeah, we thought about the thing we wanted to describe in its rest frame. And in its rest frame, a lot of the expressions are really, really simple. Okay? And as long as we were very careful to write those expressions in terms of true tensors, then that statement is true in any frame. So it's almost like a cheat. You get to get the answer from the simplest case, and as long as you write it in the, in the right language, it's true in all cases. This is exactly what we can do in GR. We can use local inertial coordinates that makes the space look very simple, at least in a neighborhood, and then we can write down a law of physics in those coordinates. And a lot of times it takes a very simple form because the space is in that region locally flat. And as long as we're very careful to write that law of physics in terms of true tensors, we can then step back and say that law of physics is true in any coordinates. In the same way that in special relativity we said it's true in any frame. Okay? Now, that is that's a very, very powerful tool, but it means that you have got to be working with tensors. And when we left off last time, we said the derivative of a tensor is not a tensor. My, my voice just broke. <laughs> Puberty at last. <laughs> Mom might let me date. What? Go ahead. So, does that imply something about these, like the local flatness of a manifold being somehow related to a rest frame? No, 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 no. The local flatness is going to an inertial frame. Okay. Remember, okay. the equivalence principle says if you allow yourself to go into free fall, then gravity disappears. That's exactly what's happening here. This is the coordinates that you would use to describe a freely falling person in this. Okay. I mean, this is kind of weird because this is a spatial geometry, so falling doesn't mean anything. 
but yeah, it's it's more tied to being in a in a freely falling or inertial frame okay. in GR. Okay. Okay. So we left off last time with the observation that we we can have tensors and know how they transform, but the minute we try and take the derivative of a tensor, this thing is not a tensor. And that is a problem because it's hard to do physics without derivatives. Okay? I mean, if everything is constant, physics is boring. We, we like for things to change in space or in time. But to describe how it changes, we need to be able to take derivatives. But we need a tensorial derivative. So that's what we're going to spend the rest of today trying to develop. And for all of what I'm about to say and how special, specialized it's going to seem, the idea of what I'm going to do today is actually very, very broadly applicable um, and finds it rears its head in many, many different contexts. So uh, let's remind ourselves of what a tensor transformation should look like. So if we have some mixed tensor T, lower mu, upper nu, and we change coordinates to some prime system, then each of those indices gets a transformation. Okay. And then with that example, you can then write down the transformation of an arbitrary tensor. And then we of course know uh, how the partial derivative transforms which the partial derivative itself kind of looks like a tensor, okay? But it's the partial derivative of a tensor which is what's screwing us up, okay? All right, so uh, I'm actually gonna remind you of what that looks like in order to motivate what we're about to do. So if I just take the partial derivative of a vector, say, so that's a tensor with one upper index, then, and we wrote this down last time, I literally just use what I know about how a vector transforms and how the partial derivative transforms, and I'm just going to write down the final result. We actually broke this up into two steps last time. Okay. So it starts off with the tensor piece. This looks like how you would expect this thing to transform because it has a lower mu index and an upper nu index. So this is actually the tensor transformation law. If that were the entire story, that would be good, but that's not the entire story. You get this extra term, and that comes from letting the derivative act not just on the tensor itself, but on the transformation of the tensor. And again, you can look at the notes from last time if that statement is not clear. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, indices floating around in here, but the really important thing to focus on is the fact that the, the piece over here that's really important is that you've taken the derivative of the transformation. If this transformation is just a bunch of constants, then this derivative is zero, and this whole thing actually transforms like a tensor. And that's what special relativity is all about in xyz coordinates, txyz. Okay. But the minute you go to curve space, or the minute you start using curvilinear coordinates, like spherical polar coordinates, then the derivative of the transformation itself is not going to be zero, and this piece exists, and it screws things up. So we might call this the tensorial part of the transformation, and this is the non-tensorial part. Okay, and these are tensors, not tonsils. Everybody got the tonsils? You guys got your tonsils? Anybody don't have their tonsils? Raise your hand if you don't have your tonsils. Yeah, Meadow. No, I don't have my tonsils either. It's, it's, five minutes. When did you get yours out? Like in kindergarten. That was two. Nice. All right, so I, 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 I only bring that up because I'm saying non-tensorial, and I had a conversation with my family Sunday night about tonsils. Anyway, good night. All right, so. Um, <laughs> 
what we want is we want to fix this train wreck. Okay? So we're going to need a new derivative. And um, one of the things that I can point out to you in this story is that there's one place where this actually works out okay. I mean, obviously, flat space and rectangular coordinates it works out, but there's actually a case that works out in any space, and that's if I take the derivative of a scalar. Okay? Because if I take the derivative of a scalar, the scalar C doesn't transform. The thing that's sitting here that's screwing it up is the thing that you use to transform T. But you don't need one of those for C. So when, you, when you're taking the derivative of a scalar, it literally transforms tensorially. Okay? So scalars have this special property that they work just fine with the ordinary derivative. For any other tensor, we're going to need a newer, gooder derivative. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, so we're going to call our new and improved derivative del. Um, in particle physics context, we would refer to it as capital D. But in Carroll's book, he uses del. Okay. And um, we're going to define it to be, first of all, the partial derivative. And that's the normal partial that we've been talking about. But then there obviously needs to be more to the story. And so we're going to add in something that looks like that where this something needs to have the same index as d and del because otherwise I, can't, I don't have any business adding it to them. But it's got a couple of dots here because I am going to have more indices in the story, but I can't tell you what those indices are yet because they won't mean anything until I act on something with this. Okay? So these dots are eventually going to be filled in with indices. I just can't put in what they are. I don't want to write something like this because in, in sort of index balancing, that should bother you, right? That, that, this is the no good, okay? New, new, new alpha beta, no good. <laughs> but we'll come back and fill those in once we actually have this thing acting on there. Okay, this guy, the correction to the derivative is called a connection. Those of you who are in, part of, in physics X on Monday will remember exhaustive discussions of connections. And um, we are, our ultimate goal today, if we can do it, is to actually figure out exactly what this connection should look like. Like what is a formal expression of the connection. Okay. But before we do that, we should write down some criteria that we expect our new and improved derivative to satisfy. So first of all, del mu should be a good derivative. Good boy. That's a good boy. I'm not talking to you, Leo. All right, so uh, what I mean by that is that it should be a linear operation, and it should have some sort of Leibniz property. And I'll go over all of these criteria in, in, in gory detail uh, throughout the course of this discussion. Um, a second and obvious criteria is that if I apply the derivative to a vector, then I should get a tensor. That's the reason we're doing this, is so that the derivative of something, which is a tensor, a vector is the simplest case, should be a tensor. Um, some things that are not so obvious, uh, but will turn out to be very powerful, is that del mu should commute with contractions. And again, a lot of these words aren't going to make sense until we go through the details. Del mu should reduce to the ordinary partial on scalars because one thing we've learned over here is that the ordinary derivative on scalars is actually okay. We don't want to break what ain't broke. Okay? Criterion E is going to seem really weird. And that is the demand that the connection be torsion free. <coughs> 
in F that the connection be metric compatible. Okay. Now I'm just going to kind of highlight in words what each of these gets us and then we're going to walk through the formal steps of actually applying all of these criteria. So conditions A and B, if we demand those two conditions, then we get a connection that is good on vectors. So we will genuinely get something which is a, it's a good derivative, it's a tensorial derivative, but only applying these two conditions, it's something that will only be applicable to vectors. Okay. When we then subsequently apply C and D, we promote that thing to a connection on arbitrary tensors. So we'll find when we apply these two things that we are then at a point where we can take the derivative of an arbitrary tensor and that will be a good tensor derivative. Okay. What E and F do is they actually take the connections that we've defined here and there are actually, there's, a, there's several different kinds of connections that you could use just applying A, B, C, D. If you then apply these two conditions, that takes the set of possible connections and reduces it to one particular type of connection called the Christoffel connection. And so in this course, uh, our working work with general relativity is going to be predicated on the use of Christoffel connections. Okay. But you can relax that and think about other variants of gravity using a different form of a connection. And so, for example, if you want to look at how you incorporate spin into gravity, that usually requires you to relax the torsion-free condition. And so the connection that you use is not the standard Christoffel connection. But we're not going to mess with that. We're just going to work with the Christoffel connection. Okay, so here we go, a piece at a time. <laughs> now I've left myself nowhere to work. All right, so let's see if we can do it here. So let's, uh, let's talk about properties associated with criterion A. So linearity means that if I apply my derivative operator to the sum of two vectors, remember everything I'm doing here is only going to be on vectors. If I apply this to the sum of two vectors, then I want the operation to distribute to the two vectors. That's the linearity of the derivative. And then the Leibniz condition is basically what you think of when you think of the product rule in calculus. And that is if I take the product of two vectors and apply the derivative, then this should reduce to something like this. Quench your eyes, that should look like the product rule from calculus. <coughs> now I would argue that both of these can be achieved by formulating the derivative of a vector as the partial derivative of the vector plus a linear transformation of the vector. And I'm going to have to write a V here because that's what I have in my notes. I'm going to start screwing up later on. Okay. So there it is. I put some, uh, I put some indices on this thing and you'll notice now that it's acting on something, the indices balance. The lambda goes away. The mu down there is the same as the mu there. The mu up here is the same as the mu's there. Okay. Now, this is of course just the derivative of the vector. Go partial derivative of the vector. This is a linear transformation. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's actually just take, for example, the, the derivative with respect to time of this thing. Okay. And now look at this. This quantity right here has two indices. One of them is summed with the index of the vector. 
So you can literally think of this as a matrix multiplying a vector. And that's what I mean by linear transformation. Okay. Now notice, I mean, you're going to get used to this, but just notice it's very important to observe that the index there is not the same as the index of the vectors here. Because this index is contracted here. This is actually rotating this vector in a, in a non-trivial way. Okay, so this is some linear transformation. Okay. All right, so what you can demonstrate, and I'm, I'm going to just post this in the notes and put it on Lon, uh, Lon Kappa. <laughs> Teaching <laughs> Physics 1. Go to Lon Kappa and check your grade. Crash the system. Uh, all right, no. Um, so you can actually demonstrate, and, I, and I've got this in the notes. I'm not going to write it down now because I don't think it's going to be very inspiring. That just defining this as the derivative plus, and this is a completely at this point general thing. It's just saying it's a matrix multiplying the vector. But because this is a linear transformation, you can demonstrate that it actually satisfies these two criteria. Okay? So all we've really done at this point is we've kind of filled in the story of what the dot dot is. We don't really have any more information about gamma at this point. Okay? But then when we apply criterion B, this is where we get some money. Because what we want is we want the derivative of a vector to transform like a true tensor. And that is when I take the derivative in one set of coordinates and then I change the coordinates, I genuinely want this to have to have a transformation law that is just the vector form. Okay, with no extra garbage at the end. Okay. Now, I am definitely not going to go through the steps of this. This is done in the book, okay, in gory detail. Um, but here's, here's where the magic sort of occurs. In order for this to be true, all right, I have to figure out how the gammas transform. Because I already know how this part of my new derivative transforms. That's, 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 that's old, old school right there. Okay. So what I do is I actually write down this in full gory detail. And I say, whatever the new version of gamma is, so that is whatever the version of gamma is in these new coordinates, so nu prime, mu prime, lambda prime, I want the new version of this to be such that everything cancels and I'm left with just this transformation. Okay? This is exactly what you do in particle physics when you're trying to figure out how the gauge field should transform. It's perfectly analogous to that. I'm just going to write down the answer and to see the details, you can look in the book. But here's the transformation rule for the connection. So in the new coordinates, the connection should take the following form. <coughs> 
gamma a tensor? Why? Uh, How do you know if something's a tensor or not? It transforms like a tensor. It's got to transform like a tensor. So you can imagine if I added in an extra index here, I would get an extra dx dx, but I wouldn't get something added to the thing. Okay. So we notice that the gamma does have a tensorial part to its transformation, but it also has a non-tensorial part. To its transformation. So gamma is not a tensor. That's why I called it a connection and not a tensor. Okay? But here's the thing. We should not have expected it to be a tensor. Because think about it. Our problem is that this thing is not doing the right thing. Okay, when I act on a vector with the normal derivative, it's non-tensorial. I'm not going to fix that by adding a tensor. A broke tensor plus a tensor does not a tensor make. <laughs> I take two broken tensors and add them together, and basically, I mean, and the devil's in the details, this screwed up part and this screwed up part take care of each other. And at the end of the day, this combination will transform as a tensor. So we actually should not have expected the connection to be a tensor because it's trying to fix something that's not a tensor. Okay? Okay, so at this point, applying A and B has gotten us the sort of index form of how this derivative acts on a vector and it's told us how the connection should transform. So we have the connection transformation law. Okay. And at this point, that's all you need if the only physics you're ever going to do involves vectors. Of course, we want to do physics with more than just vectors. Okay. We would like to do physics with higher rank tensors. So we're going to have to generalize this by applying C and D. Okay. All right, I'm going to erase this and ready. Oh. Any questions? Yeah. Say it again? No, you're good. I'm good, okay. All right. All right. <coughs> so now, uh, yeah, I'm going to try to make this fit. So now I'm going to apply criterion C. Del mu should, should com commute with contractions. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is, if I have a tensor, like a two index tensor, but I take the two indices of the tensor and I contract them with each other, that is I make them have the same index value so that it's summed over, okay? Then there's a sense in which I should be able to first take the derivative of t and then contract the indices, but I should get the same result whether I take the derivative first and then contract, or contract the indices and then take the derivative. So, um, so this thing would net me something that maybe looks like that. That's not a, not a great way to write it, but, um, but I'll write it in a better way uh, now, actually. So in order to get that to work, what we can do is we can write down what this uh, contraction looks like using separate indices and then a delta function. Okay. So the delta function we know is just going to grab this lambda index or grab the new index here and make it a lambda. It doesn't matter which way you do it. But it's going to take these two indices and make them the same. Because the delta, of course, is 1 if the two indices are the same and it's 0 if they're different. Now by the Leibniz property, I know that this just becomes this. But what I want is that this thing is just the first term. Okay? 
Because this first term is saying take the derivative first and then contract. And that's what I want because I want to be able to say that taking the derivative first and then contracting is the same as contracting first and then taking the derivative. But that is, of course, only true if this additional term here is zero. So applying this tells us that T nu, T nu lambda, I mean, those are the components of the tensor. There's no reason why these things are going to be zero in general. The only way that this thing is going to be guaranteed to vanish is if the derivative of the delta function is zero. And where I say derivative, I mean our, using our new derivative, this bell. Okay. Now that's an important first step because what we can now say is the following. Um, so this is applying uh, condition C. And I'm going to need some room for condition B. So coming out of this, we have that the derivative of the delta function should be zero. And so now if I apply condition D, what I can do is I can imagine the covariant derivative, or sorry, the, the new derivative of a scalar, C. And I want to be able to argue, or I want to apply the criteria that that reduces to just the normal partial derivative. Okay, but now I'm going to make a very judicious choice of the scalar. I am going to choose my scalar to be a dual vector contracted with a vector. That's a scalar because all the indices are summed over; they disappear. And now before I write down the details of this, because it's going to get hairy, let me just explain to you the idea. I know how the derivative acts on the vector. I want the derivative acting on the product of these to be just the partial derivative. So by studying this, I'm going to figure out how the derivative needs to act on a dual vector. That's what I'm about to get out of this. Now, once I know how the derivative acts on vectors, and I know how it acts on dual vectors, I know how it acts on an arbitrary tensor. Because an arbitrary tensor is just a collection of vector and dual vector indices. So the key thing I'm going to get out of this little argument here is, how does this act on dual vectors? And then as soon as we have that, boom, we've got it on an arbitrary tensor. Okay. So let's do this. So I'm going to break this up a bit. First, use the Leibniz. Because we expect it doesn't matter whether it's a vector or a dual vector, we should still be able to have a Leibniz property. So I can apply the derivative to the dual vector, multiplied by the vector, plus the dual vector, multiplied by the derivative acting on the vector. Okay. And then, <coughs> give myself some room. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just make a fiducial guess of what this would look like, but then I'm going to fill in actually, or I'm going to use this, this chain of argument to figure out what that guess should formally look like. So I'm going to guess that this thing should look something like the way the derivative acts on vectors, that is, it's the partial derivative plus some linear transformation of the dual vector. Okay, so this expression in parentheses here is just a guess of what this might should look like. And it's just using sort of an analogy of, of what we found the derivative acting on vectors will look like. I put a twiddle over this because the, this connection thing right here might not be the same thing that we use when we take the derivative of vectors. So for now, let's give it a different name. And then the only other thing in here is just getting the indices to work out. You know, I sum over sigma, because this is a linear transformation of the dual vector, and then I just assign the rest of the indices so that everything works out in index land. 
Okay. And then this part I actually know, right? It's just the dual vector times the derivative of the vector, but we already know how the derivative of the vector works. So now let's just collect some terms. So I'm going to collect the partial terms, and then I'm going to collect the uh, terms with the connections. So this is literally just an algebraic rewriting. There's nothing deep in what I'm doing here. partial mu of c? Everywhere. No, it's not. <laughs> Gabriel would love that. He loves to talk about the, you guys seen the professional? Gary Oldman. You need to see the professional. Go home, watch, that's your homework assignment tonight. Go home, watch the professional. But never mind, I'm not going to go. There's a line in there where it's like, yeah, the, 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 the hitman escapes and Gary Oldman's like the bad police lieutenant and they're like, who do you want us to bring out to look for him? He's like, everyone! And Gabriel does it. It's hilarious. <laughs> I can't, I can't. Anyway, okay, so um, what do I want this, what do I want these four terms to become? The first, the first. The first, the first two, exactly. I want it so that I only am left with these two because this is what you would get if you just did the partial derivative. So what I want is this to be zero. Okay? Now in order to get that to be zero, that's actually going to tell us what the gamma twiddle is. All right? Are we missing a factor of the dual vector on the last thing? Uh, yes, you are. You are so right and abusing the and, uh, lambda, yeah. Of using the ability to move things around with index notation, I just throw it in there. Okay. So, all right. So here's what we need. We need gamma twiddle, whoa, gamma twiddle sigma mu lambda omega sigma sigma v lambda to be equal to minus gamma lambda mu nu omega lambda v nu. And then I'm going to do that thing that you all hate. I'm going to grab that guy right there, and everywhere I see a lambda, I'm going to turn it into a sigma, and everywhere I see a nu, I'm going to turn it into a lambda, which I am free to do because lambda is a summed index. I can call it anything I want, and nu is a summed index. I can call it anything I want. Okay? And if I do that, then this guy is just going to become minus gamma lambda uh, sigma uh, mu lambda omega sigma v lambda. Anybody notice something special about that? There's no symmetry. Say it again? They're anti-symmetric. Well, this, this thing right here is the same thing there. So I can say that this guy right here, that's gamma twiddle, is just minus gamma. So it turns out that gamma twiddle and gamma are related in a very simple way. There's just a minus sign. Okay. So at the end of the day, we can say if I take the derivative of a dual vector, then that's the partial derivative of the dual vector minus the connection transforming the dual vector. <coughs> 
okay? Where, again, if I take the derivative of a vector, then I use plus. And then I put all the indices where I need to put the indices to get everything to work out. And now it probably comes as no surprise if you want to take the derivative of an arbitrary tensor, you start with a partial, and then you add in the appropriate connection terms for each vector and each dual vector index. So I've got a vector index of alpha, so I'm going to add in a plus gamma alpha, and let me see if I can get these right. Uh, uh, lambda mu lambda and then I have a dual vector index nu so I'm going to use minus gamma t uh, call this alpha no nope, I don't call it alpha call it beta alpha and then this is beta and then this is mu nu And so on and so on for as many uh, vector and, and dual vector indices as you want to have your tensor have. Okay. Everybody on board? Okay, so we're going to stop there. What we've got so far, having applied A, B, C, and D, is we have a derivative that we can use on any tensor and we are guaranteed that the thing that we get when we take the derivative of a tensor is itself a tensor, okay? This is a good derivative, it's got the, it's a linear operation, it's got something like a product rule, okay? So far, the other nugget that we've gotten out of this analysis is how the gamma transforms. Of course, if you know how gamma transforms, then you automatically know how gamma twiddle transforms because gamma twiddle is just minus gamma. That minus sign is not gonna change the transformation law. And then what we're gonna do when we come back next time is start off by applying these final two conditions and what that's going to let us do, and I'm just gonna give you a short preview in words, is actually get a formula for gamma in terms of second derivatives of the number, which is what we should have expected. All right, so more on that next time. Oh my gosh, we totally forgot human centipede. I thought it was multiple times. Really? Yeah, connecting things together, come on. Oh my gosh. It's like the whole right. lecture could have been I, You know, I just sud suddenly like got all mature <laughs> and fidgety and like human It happened with human centipede. Yeah, I was <laughs> human centipede, so I guess I'm now ready to go to human centipede. You're ready to join human centipede? Are there actually a few minutes before? Oh, I don't know.